We now return to another riveting episode of The Art of the Game with Ty Valentine. Welcome back, friends. In our last episode, we examined the fantastic South Park RPG, The Stick of Truth, truly a hallmark of the genre. For every game development studio, there lies a burden in excellence, and that is to craft a sequel that tops its predecessor. That burden hung over South Park Studios and Ubisoft. The question we ask today is, did they in fact build on the strengths of the first and succeed in making another modern single-player masterpiece? Join me tonight on this balls-deep dive into the fractured butthole. Transition. In a previous video, we got a look into the history of the television series South Park. Link to that in the description below. I'll be assuming you're already knowledgeable about the series and the previous game, so we'll start with the development of this one. In 2014, South Park creators Matt Stone and Trey Parker expressed interest in making a sequel after seeing the overall positive responses to their RPG The Stick of Truth, made in collaboration with Obsidian Entertainment. Ubisoft, now being the rights holders to the game, decided to place development in the hands of their in-house studio Ubisoft San Francisco. With their proprietary game engine Snowdrop, the developers were able to directly import art assets from the TV show. This allowed them to quickly implement characters and stories into the game that were introduced from the most recent episodes, making a more cohesive series universe. Ubisoft SF and South Park Studios would work together tirelessly on creating a truly authentic look to the game, down to the skeletal animations featured in the show. For some creative feedback regarding the stick of truth, Trey Parker watched PewDiePie's gameplay footage to see his raw reactions to the game's events. The Fractured Butthole's release was postponed several times as it received major reworks in story and pacing, with some missions being cut entirely. The game released on October 17, 2017 to PS4, Windows, and Xbox One, and April 2018 for Nintendo Switch. The setting again is the fictional town of South Park, Colorado, after the events of The Stick of Truth. Cartman, aka The Coon, gives a monologue about the cats of South Park mysteriously going missing and a rising crime rate. Myths tell of ancient times, when a new king united a kingdom torn apart by a powerful stick. Hi, hon. Shut up, man. There's no time to waste. I have to go back, change the present if I can, and find this cat. And in doing so, perhaps I can change what has happened to all of us. In the children's fictional land of Zaron, a great battle is taking place between the forces of Koopa Keep and the Moorish. At this time, you, the king of Koopa Keep, are pinching one off in your bathroom. We exit to your parents arguing in the hallway about your exceptional friend-making abilities, conflicting with their attempts to hide in the small town. Paladin Butters and High Jew Elf Kyle await at your front door, requesting aid in the skirmish outside. You defeat a handful of Moors in combat, but the entrance to Koopa Keep is blocked by a moat of hot lava. Your enemies release an attack dragon to secure their victory, but your hammer of heavenly rain slays the beast in one strike. Using the secret rooftop entrance to the kingdom of Koopa Keep, you gracefully slide down and- I thought the king was going to do a sweet jump, but then he just did that. You're dead. You gracefully slide down and leap into the castle grounds of Cartman's backyard. The gang confronts a group of Moors harassing Jimmy the Bard and notices Grand Wizard Cartman is missing when suddenly the Coon drops in from the future. Carrying a missing cat poster with a hundred dollar reward on it, the Coon convinces his friends to switch games to superheroes, a game in which you are not invited. You infiltrate the Coon Lair after acquiring the key code from Cartman's journal. The Coon and friends are discussing their plan to rescue rescue the cat from the poster, and use the reward money to boost their superhero franchise's popularity. Cartman allows you to play along, and helps you decide what kind of superhero you will be. Part of creating that persona is establishing your tragic backstory. You lay awake that night, like so many other nights. You couldn't sleep because you knew you weren't like the other kids. You walked to the mirror.
You walk to the mirror. Over there, the mirror. Just, okay, just walk up. No, not there. Not, God damn it. When you were younger, you beat up a bunch of home invaders using your special powers, only to then witness your dad fuck your mom. The coon attempts to console you on seeing such a horrific event, then assigns you your first mission of adding a few followers to your coonstagram profile by taking selfies with the locals. This is for the sake of boosting coon and friends clout. Kyle, the human kite requests your aid in banishing his annoying alternate universe version of himself, Cousin Kyle, the Human Kite 2. By assisting the Human Kite and helping Super Craig locate his lost guinea pig, you unlock your first combat buddies. You are then tasked with filling out the rest of your character sheet by doing various superhero missions around the town. The first groups of enemies your team encounters are the 6th graders and Professor Chaos's henchmen who have been pouring lava in various locations. In Morgan Freeman's Taqueria, he instructs you on the basics of crafting and gives you the recipe for the legendary Enchirito. That's the first time anyone's ever done that. By helping Mosquito escape the clutches of the temptress Raisins girls, and avoid paying his tab, he in turn helps you choose your character's kryptonite. No superhero is invincible according to the rules of the game. The Raisins girls become Coon and Friend's newest contingent of sworn enemies. Father Maxi makes an attempt to help you confront your fears by locking you in a dark room. Echoes of your past begin to stir, when suddenly you are cornered by two very handsy Catholic priests. After you handily kick their asses, Father Maxi chastises them and hands you a macaroni picture of the Star of David. The picture can be used to summon Moses in times of need. Counselor Mackey at the elementary school helps you further fill out your character sheet by asking you your sex and gender identity. A bunch of southern hicks filled with misplaced outrage bully you over your newly defined identity. Well, well, well. If it ain't a cisgendered boy. We don't take kindly to your types around here. Let's welcome this thing to our town. The coon informs you that your superhero character kind of sucks and allows you to dual class. A call for help comes in from the human kite as rival supergroup Freedom Pals is quarreling with your fellow coon friends. In the battle that follows, the coon manages to steal Dr. Timothy's phone for information on the criminal activity in town. Coon and friends discover evidence of a girl with a dick tattoo who may have knowledge about the missing cat. Your next mission is to sneak out of your house at night and find the girl with the dick tattoo before Freedom Pals. Back at home, you again find find your parents fighting. This time, your father is concerned that your mother may have revealed the truth about you on a phone call with Counselor Mackey regarding your sexual identity. They chastise each other about their growing addictions to cannabis and alcohol before they notice you in the room and suddenly halt their heated discussion. You gloomily eat your dinner and head to bed, awaiting nightfall before sneaking out to continue your recon mission with fellow coon friend Captain Diabetes. Down the street, Randy Marsh is found drunkenly keying his wife's car when the captain makes the noble decision to confiscate the car keys before Randy can drive drunk on a beer run. He decides to fight the two of you for the keys, but falls before your combined might. In Human Kite's attic, you both use his zip line to descend into downtown South Park, where you pass by the drunken bedlam created by a country concert on your way to the Peppermint Hippo. A couple of blacked out patrons at the strip club, who have confused you for strippers yourselves, give you information on the penis emblazoned stripper after you give them lap dances. Yeah, yeah, classy, that's her name. Her name is Classy? Yeah, Classy with an I, and a little dick that hangs off the C which fucks the L out of the ASS. Of course! Captain Diabetes comes up with a plan to spike the DJ's drink so that you can use his microphone to draw Classy out by announcing her to the stage. Using a mixture of boogers, cum, rat turds, and a fart mixed into a gin and tonic, your disgusting drink makes the DJ violently ill. The ruse works, but Classy retreats to the back room, mistaking the two of you for police officers. Her fellow strippers rush to her defense, including the menacing spontaneous Boutte, whose devastating area of effect attack can kill in one hit. As she escapes to the adjacent restaurant, one of Classy's counterparts threateningly fires a shot into the air, only to have the electric sign above fall and kill him. The sign blocks your path, requiring you to unleash one of your unique fart powers, the ability to revert the state of matter. Morgan Freeman's Force Ghost instructs you to eat the Enchirito he helped you craft earlier to unlock this power. In the back of Bukadif- 
Yeah, I'm not reading that. In the back of the Italian restaurant, you find a collection of imprisoned cats, as well as Classy standing besides a group of mafiosos. That ain't no cop. That's Captain Diabetes. When he was born, his mom fought it during labor and it gave him diabetes that he uses to fight crime. But that is not how people get diabetes. If they aren't cops, then we can shoot them. Along with this bitch, too. A red wine drunk Randy storms through the door, demanding his car keys back before the gangsters have a chance to murder you. The Coon and friends defeat him in battle again and take Classy back to the Coon lair for information about scrambles. She informs the heroes of a man paying sixth graders to abduct the cats around town, but refuses to divulge any more information until she feels protected. We cut to a meeting between Police Commissioner Yates and the Fambony crime family. Yates is angry about the outcome at the restaurant and the evidence found at the scene. The the following day, you meet Classy at Fastpass's house for questioning, but she won't talk to you before she gets her prescription medication first. In order to pass by the automated minor detecting defense guns at the medicinal fried chicken store, which is really a medical cannabis dispensary in disguise, Morgan Freeman informs you that you must unlock your next fart power, the ability to stop time. He gifts you the recipe for the cheesy shrimp burrito, which can be used to unlock that power. New kid, I see you've also come to assist in assuring Classy's cooperation. Inside the dispensary, you and the coon find a recently sobered up Towley working behind the counter. His sobriety comes at a cost, though, as the problems in his life and a mistake with Classy's prescription sent him spiraling into a fit of rage. By burning piles of weed in the store, Towley's demeanor changes as he gets high off of the fumes. He then hands you the prescription, and you return to Fast Pass's house, where Classy rolls herself a joint to calm down. All right. That's much fucking better. All right, listen. The place y'all niggas need to go is you store it. That's where they taking the cats, you know what I'm saying? That's it. Coon, this is Fast Pass. The new kid got the intel from Classy. Not bad, new kid. The Coon then allows you to take on a third superhero class, after which you are called to the park to meet with rival freedom pal, Toolshed. Stan expresses his gratitude for your taking his father's car keys away, and that he owes you one. PC Principal teaches you about microaggressions, and confirms with you your race, ethnicity, and skin tone, adding another attribute to your character sheet. Coon and friends realize they can use Toolshed's power of clearing away lava to gain entrance to the You Store It facility. They anonymously message him, asking him to meet the new kid at the storage yard alone later that night. Once again, you head back home to await nightfall, where once again you encounter your parents fighting. This time about the talks apropos of your race you and your mother shared with PC Principal. Our little boy is hurting, don't you get it? He's asking questions about his race and sexual orientation because he's confused. Confusion was the point! The more our child learns about the truth, the more dangerous it becomes, you stupid whore! Uh, hey, look who's here! Later that night, Toolshed meets you outside your house to accompany you to the storage yard that Professor Chaos has turned into his headquarters. The rest of Coon and friends appear from the shadows, and Toolshed reluctantly uses his sandblaster power to clear the way for everyone. Professor Chaos surprises the gang with a monologue, expositing his evil plan. He is using the money he received to watch over the storage facility to one-up the Mystery King pin stirring up crime around town. He then unleashes his deadly attack hamsters. Minions? No, minions, you gotta kill him. Ah, oh, dang it. God damn it. All right, let's just find what we're looking for and get out of here. Later, the professor sends more of his minions to stop you, including handfuls of aluminum foil armored migrant workers. From the rooftops, Call Girl shows up to lend a hand and offer help should the new kid call upon her. In a loading bay, Coon and Friends is trapped by General Disarray, Professor Chaos's right-hand man. They seem to have been collecting vast amounts of lava for nefarious purposes. The general breaks out their secret weapon, the Mecha Minions. After Disarray's defeat, Super Craig is trapped by a river of lava. Toolshed is unable to free him, as is impractically large air compressor is out of reach. Things seem hopeless for our super friend when the new kid hatches a plan. You plug the air hose into your ass and use your incredible powers of flatulence to blast away the lava and free Super Craig from certain death. Deeper in the compound, the team discovers a secret laboratory where meth heads are illegally harvesting cat urine. It ain't us, okay? The big man has all the crime families working together. The Italians, the Russians, the sixth graders, they all work for him. We just put the cat urine in the drugs and alcohol. Who is the big man? He don't even do it for the money, man. 
It's like, it's like he wants more crime in the streets. Wow, that sounds spooky. You don't even know spooky, man. We got to do this if they tell us. Don't you get it? We're already dead for telling you. The Kunin friends get a glance at Professor Chaos's grand plan on the rooftop. We see dump trucks being filled with red Lego pieces. The professor intends to trap all of South Park in place by filling the streets with hot lava. After defeating the professor, the gang imprisons him at the Coon Lair for interrogation. Butters claims not to know who the new criminal mastermind is in South Park due to the Kingpin's affinity for disguise. Cartman claims the only person capable of such chameleon-like behavior is someone named Mitch Connor, who had previously impersonated Jennifer Lopez. After a press conference announcing an arrest warrant issued for the farting vigilante, Commissioner Yates colludes with Mitch Connor. The next day, Coon and friends come up with a scheme for the new kid to defect to the Freedom Pals and act as a spy for their information on the unfolding conspiracies. Professor Chaos offers his help as his hero class is capable of hacking the entrance to the Freedom Pals headquarters. By launching Butter's hamster out of your ass at electrical panels, you are granted the ability to bypass various security systems. At the Freedom Pals base, Dr. Timothy demands you prove your loyalty on a mission with human Tupperware. That mission? To entertain old people at the senior center. I love to play my triangle, my triangle goes. When, when I am sad, I love to hear my triangle go. It cheers me up. And it makes me smile. You suck! We're sorry, folks. This kid's new. The old people realize that you are the wanted vigilante after demonstrating your trumpet playing ability. They attack the Freedom Pals, resulting in a bloody, shitty race to the exit. Once you've escaped to safety outside, Dr. Timothy welcomes you as an official member of the Freedom Pals. You are immediately tasked with another mission at the police station later that night, on an investigation into evidence that the cops are being paid off by the crime lord. The coon calls a meeting of the friends after listening in on the conversation, and insists they also go to the police station that night, as their informant Classy had been arrested earlier that morning. The friends are dismissed and you return home after choosing a third character class for your build. It isn't long before your parents are fighting again, this time both clearly drunk and stoned, yelling about medication being put in your food. After dark, Mysterion greets you as you both step out into the streets, where all of the adults are incredibly intoxicated by their cheese-laced drugs and alcohol. The two rival superhero franchises meet outside of the police station, and the Freedom Pals reluctantly accept help from the Kunin friends. The cops inside are all intoxicated as well, and decide to beat up a bunch of fourth grade children, which certainly isn't the least realistic element of this story. The commissioner attempts to make an appeal to pity. I know that to a young kid it can seem like cops are racist and bigoted, but you can't believe what the media tells you. Cops are just people, like you, your friends, your family. People who work hard to- Spook! Oh! Uh, Tupperware! Damn it, Levinsky, get your ass upstairs, sir! On the second floor, we see in the holding cells the criminals the police have been arresting en masse, and you free them. On the third floor, past the masturbating NSA agent, you find Yates cheesing with scrambles. The commissioner unlocks a cell door, revealing a horrific monster that feeds on the blood of the innocent. Jared Fogel and his aides prove to be powerful opponents against the children, but the might of Freedom Pals is stronger than that of the convicted child sex tourist? What the fuck? He gives you the door code to the morgue, where you find a big spooky skeleton door leading to a dark chamber. The police have been ritualistically sacrificing innocent black people to outer god shub ni yeah, I'm not reading that. The police have been ritualistically sacrificing innocent black people to an outer god, whose powers are drained when fed white people. A battle of epic proportions takes place as you bait the police into being consumed by the great tentacled hell beast. Killing the monster saves Classy and Scrambles, and the Kunin friends take the cat to secure their $100 reward money. Dr. Timothy surmises that the Freedom Pals were tricked, and thus turns your super sidekicks against you. Call Girl and Professor Chaos jump in to help you free your friends' minds to defeat the doctor. Dr. Timothy! You fucking animal! He was trying to help us! Dude, Mysterion is pissed at you, new kid. You guys started this war, not us! You don't fucking understand! Dr. Timothy was working on a way to save all of us! Freedom Pals and Coon Friends! What? 
Freedom Pals takes you to their base and reveals Dr. Timothy's secret plans, an intricate long-term roadmap for movies and TV shows that gives every hero equal screen time. They realize their combined strength into one franchise could make them all millions of dollars, and thus absorb Coon and Friends into Freedom Pals. All seems well until the following morning, when you discover your kitchen splattered with blood. On the morning news, Mitch Connor is using the horrific events at the police station to sway favor from South Park during his mayoral candidacy announcement. At Stark's Pond, an aquatic superhero waits for you with a request for help. Well, it is I, Sea Man! A powerful superhero with the amazing ability to talk to fish and swim. It's Seaman! That's Sea Man! It is my job to help all creatures of the sea. And right now, there is a gay fish who wants help getting his mother into heaven. Apparently, yay, I mean, a gay fish near the bottom of the lake needs assistance getting his mother to heaven. You grab his flipper as he transports you and Seaman to Valhalla, where the gay fish's mother is seen riding a unicorn. A game of Flappy Bird ensues as you control the unicorn's rainbow farts through the sky past Zazul, the gay fish's idealization of his own haters. The mother fish makes it through heaven's golden gates. Jesus Christ helps you finalize your character sheet with your alignment and religion and lets you take a selfie with him. Back on the ground, the Southern White Fox news viewers return again to attempt to beat you up over your beliefs, values, and identity. You handle them and head to Freedom Pal's headquarters, where Dr. Timothy's franchise plans have been vandalized. A surprise call from Mitch Connor comes onto the view screen. Looks like I had something that the new kid wants. That's good, because the new kid had something that I want. Connor, that son of a bitch! Care to make a trade, new kid? Let's make a deal. Hey, listen, you're gonna be in big trouble if you don't- <laughs> 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 Cartman attempts to profess his innocence as the heroes realize that he may have been the one to ruin their franchise plans. Dr. Timothy unlocks all the rest of the character classes for you. Outside, Mitch leads you to a series of locations around town, during which time he steals all of your Coonstagram followers. Call Girl tracks Connor's communications back to the community center, where he lays in wait with Cartman. After an arduous battle, Connor vanishes, and the Freedom Pals take the Coon back to base. You put your incredible farting talents to use with a selection of horrible flatulence and Producing foods in order to make Cartman talk. He reveals that Mitch was interested in genetically engineering the cats to make them more powerful, leading the gang to the only place capable of such demented science, Dr. Mephisto's laboratories. Unfortunately, the labs are not open to tours until much later in the day. Morgan Freeman's Force Ghost appears again to help you unlock your next fart ability, the power to advance time. Dr. Mephisto takes you on a tram ride through his ass-adding facility, showing off the genetic advancements he has made with plants by giving them multiple asses. There are combination animals, and he has even been working on his dead son Terrence. Mephisto had been contracted by a Mr. Connor to create an army of mutated 6th graders to protect his genetically altered cats. Mitch Connor traps the Freedom Pals and disables the security protocols for the locks on the cages that hold the cats with many asses. Fighting past the escaped experiments, you come upon a chamber where Cartman has been tied up by Mitch. You capitalize on the moment by taking a picture of Mitch's plans, and Connor makes his escape. In another laboratory, you find your parents. The entrance to the lift that leads out of the lab requires a large organic DNA sample. In order to get out, one of your parents' body parts must be harvested, which would in turn kill that parent. You make the ultimate choice of which parent must die. Mitch Connor awaits the gang near the exit, where he reveals his secret mutant super weapon. Mutant Human Kite 2 is susceptible to sunburns, so by advancing time with your new fart ability, the giant is left vulnerable as he applies sunblock. He also needs to remove the lotion before his skin breaks out at nightfall, which you use your power again to invoke. After defeating the Gargantuan, the Freedom Pals are horrified to realize that your fart ability has advanced time by an entire week, and Mitch Connor has already been voted in as mayor. To undo the damage, Morgan Freeman concocts you a new meal to hone your time warp powers and send you all back to before Connor is an office. Unfortunately, you don't quite believe in yourself. 
which sabotages your power and takes everyone farther forward in time. In this version of the future, Mayor Connor has declared every day to be Christmas, which has led to the destruction of town through widespread partying and chaos. The gang is confronted by the demonic woodland Christmas critters, who can only be defeated with the help of Santa. Your time fart has left your butthole fractured, leaving you and Freedom Pals stuck in the future unless you can find a doctor to fix it. At the abortion clinic, the doctor heals you up and you finally make the fart to the past. You find your past selves at the beginning of the story and try to convince them of Cartman's evil plans, but you don't believe yourselves. You fight past them, run up to Cartman's room where he is about to make his first leap in time, and find Mitch Connor. Heh! <laughs> Hello, Freedom Pass. Time travel. Ain't it a bitch? Connor! What the hell are you doing here? I had a plan to use the new kid as means to get what I always wanted. But it looks like some do-gooders traveled back in time to stop me. Cartman, I swear to God, if you don't knock it off, I'm- But that's okay, because I still know something you all don't. What's that? How to make someone fart super bad by hitting them in the solar plexus. Yeah! Connor, no! Where are we now, Connor? We're in the time that a superhero was born. Recognize this place, new kid? A little child laying awake at night, unable to sleep. Why have you brought us here? Don't you see? This is the night, new kid. The fateful night your dad fucked your mom. You walked to the mirror. Don't do this to him. But don't you see, Coon? This is what he wanted all along. To fix it. <sighs> you heard your mother calling for help, so you left your room. During your trip to the tragic beginning of your superhero backstory, you discover the home invaders simply wanted you to add them on Coonstagram so they could get some more followers. In your parents' bedroom, the family secret is revealed as your parents explain their otherworldly talents for social media. Their combined genetics created you, a child with the power to get 10 million followers upon birth. That's why we had to escape, because we knew the government would use you to do horrible things. And we've been on the run ever since, moving from city to city, always trying to stay one step ahead. But everywhere we go, you just can't seem to stop gaining followers. This prompted them to suppress your social skills by giving you medicine in your food and hide in small town South Park. The knowledge of your true self allows you to believe in yourself and fart your way towards saving the day. Your time fart brings you to Mitch Connor's inauguration, but before the Freedom Pals do anything, they try to force Cartman to admit his wrongdoing. Mitch Connor, you've always been Mitch Connor, and you better stop right fucking now! Then how do you explain this, Cal? Well, 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 the plot thickens. That's not funny, Cal. I'm not doing it. The team battles Mitch Connor from another universe when suddenly this universe's Mitch Connor appears in the coon's hand. At the end of the battle, amends are made by Kyle admitting he was fucking with everyone. Just before Mitch is sworn in as mayor, the team exposes the town to his plans with the photo taken earlier. Connor admits that his evil was brought about by him seeing his dad get fucked when he was nine. Since then, he swore vengeance on the world. Suddenly, his mother appears. She admits that she was the one who fucked Mitch's dad all those years ago. Mitch is furious at this revelation, and the two of them fight, killing each other. Well, thank God that guy isn't gonna be mayor. Come on, everybody. Let's go get clean drugs and alcohol from the next town over. Yeah! With respect to the story structure of this game, there are more similarities than differences to the last one. The simple premise of finding the thing to give your team an edge against the other unfolds into a vast web of conspiracies you and the gang never intended on being involved in. You all learn to work together for the common good. A whole bunch of crazy shit happens along a narrative thread that involves discovering who you really are. It's strange to me that the big reveal about your family secret is the same as the end of the Stick of Truth, but in this game they tacked on the character arc of believing in yourself. Again, writer Trey Parker satirizes the tropes of the genre the developers are emulating. The melancholy backstories every superhero has, the convoluted plot twists, the cinematic multiverse approach to the IPs, it's all made fun of in classic South Park fashion. My biggest problem with the plot of this game is the ending. The stakes are significantly lower in Fractured Butthole, being that really only the town of South Park is in danger. Compare this to the Stick of Truth, where the fate of the entire universe hung in the balance. It really ends up being Cartman wanting to fuck over Freedom Pals. I was fully 
invested in the story until Mitch Connor was introduced. I mean, when the human kite and the coon are fighting, Cartman, in so many words, admitted to Mitch Connor just being a way to fuck with everyone. Then he's exposed in front of a small crowd and his hands slap each other around. The end, I thought, was that supposed to be the emotional and explosive final battle? Part of Cartman's character is that he's very ignorant and fucks up his own plans when they begin to conflict with reality. This only serves to diminish the threat that Mitch Connor presents to the town, since he and Cartman are one and the same. Allow me to propose an alternate villain here. Imagine if at the end of this game the criminal kingpin is revealed to be some otherworldly galactic conqueror. Some kind of super intelligent warlord from another galaxy, sent to Earth to sow chaos from within, who starts with South Park as sort of a test run. You could keep all the other bad guys doing the same things, just at the behest of this warlord. His plans would soon spread to the rest of the planet, so the ticking clock element would be there. Freedom Pals and Coonan friends would be unable to defeat him on their own and would have to join forces to take him on. Somehow your farting abilities would sway the battle. There would even be a charming element to this warlord in the contrast of his intimidating presence to playing by the rules of this children's game where they take turns attacking and their powers are just make-believe. You end up on his secret moon base or something and it blows up at the end. The town goes back to normal and no one but the children know what was really going on or how close human civilization was to destruction. Then one of them says, I'm bored of playing superheroes. Let's go play Counter-Strike. Yeah, sounds good. Cut to credits. All of the humorous elements inherent to South Park as well as an epic conclusion. Sounds a little more exciting, right? Yeah, it's 100% the bog standard plot for a superhero story, but that's where the satire comes in. Uh, the ending absolutely dropped the ball for me, and all it would have taken was some tweaks to the main villain. There were also sections that made me wonder where the punchline was. Like this part where all we hear is a cop wrestling with a cat in the forensics lab with the lights out. Where's that blasted cat? <laughs> Oh no, I think the cat just jumped into the exhaust fan and jammed it. The gas is filling up the room and it's killing me again. I'm dying again. Hmm. Sounds like the emergency door closed. It just goes on and on, but there's no payoff once the lights turn on. Is this just a point in the story they forgot to animate? Did they run out of time and just say, fuck it, we gotta record the voice lines anyway? If so, why even do the scene in the first place? Just show the aftermath so we can move forward. There were significant advancements made in gameplay since the Stick of Truth. Big improvements to quality of life in combat. This game displays the order of turns this time, which is definitely handy for turn-based combat. It has a knockback system that injures enemies that are pushed into one another and your teammates. You're allowed movement in battle so you can position yourself strategically. We have damage and heal displays pre-turn, very nice. We're allowed turn skips so you don't force yourself into attacking an enemy with reflect damage turned on. Car. Stay out of the street, damn kid! Clear. We get button prompts displayed during attacks and defense which is great because in the Stick of Truth I could never remember what buttons to press and when in the heat of battle. They introduce a crafting system, which I don't think adds or subtracts anything from the game. The recipes you get for artifacts always seemed underpowered compared to the ones I would just buy or earn in battle. Like, it's nice to be able to craft health potions, revives, and antidotes without having to walk to a vendor. But even so, you're never too far from a vendor, and the economy is such that money isn't an issue after a couple hours. I don't know, maybe this was an inside joke where Matt and Trey said to the devs, Oh, we gotta include a pointless crafting system, because every game has to have one these days. Lol. I had only a couple things in my notes that I thought were definite downgrades gameplay-wise. For some reason, the sprint function didn't make it into the sequel. The walk speed seems maybe slightly faster faster than from the previous game, but it just wasn't quite fast enough. Like, come on guys, this ain't Skyrim. There ain't a whole lot of scenery to appreciate after a while. Another speed bump for me was seeing a cutscene every single time before and after fast travel. Yes, it's funny, but not after the 14th time. Items can't be used in the same turn as attacks this time, which I guess I understand if it was for the sake of speeding up combat. Some of these battles last 10 to 15 minutes each, and picking an item to use for every character before you pick an attack 
is just gonna lose those of us with attention spans of goldfish. Wait, humans have shorter attention spans than goldfish? Enemies don't lay on the ground anymore after defeat. I thought it was funny being able to hit them as they play dead. All right, getting back to the good stuff. Attributes and slots are not assigned to items in the fracture. This means you can design your costumes however you like without worrying about which ones happen to work best for your build. More freedom with the fit. The artifacts that boost your stats create a sort of power aggregate called might. So slotting different aspects is usually as easy as seeing what makes the big number higher. Also, this game has a mini-map. I would say that's an improvement, but in this day and age, if your game doesn't have a mini-map, it's like not writing your name on a test at school. Like, yes, writing your name on the test is an improvement over not writing your name on it. Not much difference or improvement graphically between the two games from what I could tell, other than some cleaner looking particle effects. The authenticity is more in line with the show since Ubisoft SF could import assets and animations the show creators use. We've got a welcome redesigned in UI for the menu systems. It's a definite step up from the stick of truth with how straightforward and intuitive it feels. Sound design is on par with the last game. The orchestral soundtrack sounds like it could fit right into any Marvel movie movie, they actually went ahead and wrote an entirely original score for this game, as opposed to lifting tracks from the show for the last one. Definitely an oversight not to feature Cartman in at least one of the tracks, though. There were a few continuity issues. At the police station, the front desk attendant switches voices between lines. What are you supposed to be? A rodeo clown? Sorry, I don't selfie with just anyone. Who are you supposed to be? Dork bad? Then there's this guy at the D-Mobile store. Nice! Wanna upgrade to the unlimited selfie plan? Boy, that crab people smell really lingers. Overall, The Fractured Butthole is certainly a great South Park game. To list our comparisons to the last one, we've got improved combat, pretty much the same graphical fidelity and sound design, plenty of jokes, although a few that don't quite land, and a downgraded story, at least in the last third of the game. The story really hooks me in more than anything else in video games, and it is for that reason that I have to go with The Stick of Truth being the superior title. I still wouldn't really recommend either game to anyone who isn't already a fan of South Park. I hope that if a third game is made, that South Park Studios and the developers are given a little more time to refine it and iron out the wrinkles. They outright admitted that they didn't have as much time to make this one. There were moments that, like in the last game, I was reminded of how important it is to keep a healthy sense of imagination. To just create for the sake of creating and have fun being in the moment. As crude, offensive, and downright disgusting the South Park series can be, I think it still manages to highlight how important caring for one's inner child is. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to click some of those buttons below and leave a comment. If you like this video, be sure to check out some of my other videos. And as always, stay excellent and have a great evening. Out. God damn it, I'm not supposed to say out.